While the panel is getting settled, I'm going to take these few extra minutes to acknowledge somebody who's usually here and is conspicuously absent this year because she was fundamental to Rebecca's first fiber shed wardrobe. Um, and she raises, she's usually sitting right in the back there. She's the breed steward of a rare breed of Jacob sheep. And her name is Robin Lind. And she might be watching. So if you guys can wave and say, hi, Robin. We love you. <laughs> um, last month, Robin had a very serious farm accident. She had brain surgery and was in an induced coma, and she's doing very well. I think she's coming home today. Um, and Robin always said that her farm club community, which is kind of like a CSA for fiber, but also folks who come and work on her farm, was the best idea that she ever had. And it was, because we had things like spreadsheets of breeding charts for her sheep and all of her stuff in inventory systems. So Robin's dear friends, Jackie Post, Colleen Simon, and Mary Schaefer are running her booth today. It is in the adjacent building. Um, and I hope you will support Robin and her friends. Um, her website is also Meridian Jacobs, and she will be hosting people. She's so excited to see all of you. Some Saturdays in December at her farm, where her farm shop will be open. Um, so thanks. She would have been on this panel normally, um, but she's not. But we do have some wonderful folks here. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you. And I think each person present here is going to be introducing themselves mm -hmm. and their core work with slides. And I think we'll go in, can we do a start? Which order? We can do you want us to sit in order or are we, are we cool? I, think I think it's order by slides, yeah, right, Rebecca? Yes. Yeah, so the next slide, I don't have a, there it is, great. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Terrific, okay, so first we'll begin with Molly Taylor from PT Ranch. Hello. Hang on, so just, I mean. Thank you. Hello. Hello? Yeah? Hi, um, thanks for having me. My name is Molly. Um, it's really nice to be here, um, mostly because it's been conversations like this that have really been the gateway for me to um, become involved in agriculture. Um, I don't have an agricultural background. I uh, grew up in the Bay Area, and then I went to university in New York City. Um, I never dreamed that I would be in agriculture. It was never um, really a, a passion <laughs> of mine. I loved to eat. I liked to go outside. Um, I was a little bit of a horse nerd when I was younger. Um, but that was kind of the extent of my like agricultural exposure. Um, uh, so, yeah, let's see what the first slide is. But yeah, chickens. Um, <laughs> um, two years ago, I started working alongside my mother um, at our family's ranch in um, Amador County, which is in the foothills. And um, she had a few chickens there, and, and she had been kind of talking to me about regenerative agriculture. and. You know, theoretically, it sounded really interesting to me, and the you know the nexus of climate change and agriculture and being able to actually produce something that um, can have a positive impact not only on the person eating it but the the land that it's grown on um, and the farmers themselves was really inspiring to me. So we started working together, um, and I'm happy to say that the the measly 30 chickens that she had at the time grew into a couple thousand chickens at this point. Um, they're not all live at once, but <laughs> over the last two years, we've raised um, almost 5,000 chickens, um, which we sell direct to consumer at two farmers markets every week. We raise a Freedom Ranger, which are these red chickens right here. Um, let's see here. We also have olives, which this photo is hard to see, but um, we have olives and we also do sheep. Um, we manage, or we, we try to manage our animals regeneratively. So we, we move, the, all the chickens are pasture raised, they're in salads and style coops that are moved every day. Um, our sheep are also moved nearly daily. Um, and most of it is truly, truly trial and error for me. I mean, I. 
I just have to watch what's happened and then wait for a season and see what's different. And um, quite honestly, my, my observation skills are not as finely tuned as someone who may have been brought up within this culture. So, um, you know, I, I, there are things that I never noticed about a landscape that I'm starting to really pay attention to. Um, and that, that relationship has been um, really interesting just to see like things kind of popping out of landscapes that otherwise would have gone unnoticed. Um, so, um, yeah, it's, it's been really inspirational working with my family and um, my mom's dedication to this project has been um, really encouraging because as I, as I seek resources to educate myself about agriculture, and in particular regenerative agriculture, I often find that you know, the evidence is somewhat inconclusive. And you know, I ask my local cooperative extension agent, well, what do I do? You know, how do I do it this way? And they don't necessarily have the answers, so I kind of have to <laughs> take what they say and then reinvent it. And it's groups like this that really are supportive of, of those decisions in moments when there's not a lot of clarity as the decision maker. So much appreciated. Should I go, go ahead? ahead? Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Judy Petit, and my project is called BioHue. And I named it that because um, I like the idea of living color. And it was that notion, it's right around 2006, um, as a visual artist, I was painting, drawing. I was working with uh, acrylics and getting really tired of it. And I wanted a change. And I knew that I could do it, um, but I had to start. So I started in my garden, and I started growing plants and um, processing them for color and um, making ink, making paint and for my um, own use, and then started teaching workshops and making product. And um, it's been amazing and wonderful. Um, I get to be outside and um, work with the things that I love and spend time in the kitchen and do research. I love research as well. So I'm touching the past and the present. So in the past, I get to look at old recipes, look at the history of art, and see how we can apply it to practices today. And I'm really excited that um, it's growing. I have more and more people asking me about it. So um, uh, I'm really excited and, and um, was super excited to work with when Molly approached me, uh, what was it, April, May? May, um, to work on our project together. So more on that a little bit later. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's um, from, a, from the process, so when I extract the pigment, um, one of the things that I learned um, was that it's um, working this way isn't always about a particular outcome or a product. <laughs> the painting um, or the performance is, is happening continuously. Um, so what we've got here are all of the um, coffee filters and cloth scraps and things that I've saved and created an installation out of them. It's wonderful because it's site specific and it can be as large as or small as I'd like it to be. That's my studio. Oh, there we go. And there's, um, and I get to go out and forage. So whether I'm growing it in my garden or I'm foraging or exchanging with other people, um, this is eucalyptus bark from um, the Delta region. So I get to I collect in the Delta region, uh, collect out in the Sierra foothills is where I'm at right now. Um, so I'll be picking up things and learning along the way and um, get to make some great colors in the process. That was weld, was the watercolor. And then here what we've got on the far right is the persicaria that I grew in um, Amador County with Molly on her ranch. Down here in the bottom, that's from fig leaves. Over on the left, that's cochineal. And up there is Coreopsis. And we have Coreopsis tinctoria right up here on the stage. 
And over on the left, um, some student work from UC Berkeley Botanical Garden. So I've been partnering with um, different uh, facilities and um, gardens all around the Bay Area. It's been awesome. All right, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Leslie Atkins from Hartfield <laughs> Fiber Farm. Yeah. <laughs> it's um, a very small farm. I call it a mini eco fiber farm. Um, unique um, on small acreage in Sonoma County. And um, it combines my um, environmental science background, my um, lifelong interest and uh, uh, care of animals, and um, my artistic bent, all in one. Um, we have a, a small but diverse flock, including three breeds of primitive sheep, but now we focus mostly on these tiny, rare Wesson sheep. We're one of the, the few at, in Fibershed who we're trying to develop and conserve this special breed. Um, but we also have, have llama alpaca, a couple of fiber goats, and I make beautiful final things from them, and it, this farm has to support itself on wool sales alone because it is a no-kill farm. The animals have names, they live out their lives, and I get the pleasure of doing, taking care of them. Um, we have a carbon farm plan, a beautiful plan that was developed by Mari Stewart, and we're implementing it little by little on our three and a half acres. Um, it's a beautiful, comprehensive plan, and uh, as a result, our uh, wool is considered uh, climate beneficial wool. Every year we do more this year. We um, got a wonderful grant from Fibershed to do a lot of um, hedgerow and windbreak and um, also silvopasture planting. So um, now we are specializing in these tiny, rare Wesson sheep. Um, they're charming. They have beautiful uh, fiber. And um, you'll hear more about it later. Um, I do education on the farm. And this little curriculum you can glance over is a result of a wonderful collaboration that you'll hear about later that Gail, Gail brought a knitting retreat to our farm. And it, um, it shows how much can go on on a little farm. All these components are going on all the time. These are some of the beautiful yarns of 12 different colors that come from our small flock. And um, I think that's it for now. Thank you, Leslie. <laughs> well, um, I'm grateful to be here. I am nothing but a catalyst, actually, because I am a knitter. That's who I am and what I do. Uh, I teach people how to do that, and I um, have basically been on a fiber adventure my whole life. I am a great uh, believer in Madame Defarge and her revolutionary knitting skills, and you all need that, because when we do get people on those guillotines, <laughs> <laughs> you need to be ready, people, ready. So, Sheep to shawl is uh, something that's come up in the knitting world quite a bit in an attempt to give knitters the tools to make good choices, right? There's no bad yarn, but we've been indoctrinated to believe that there's only one kind of yarn, and that is a super soft, highly processed product, which may have its place, but there's so much more to, to put in your hands. And it's so much more interesting when you understand the story of it. So part of the process of education this year from my little world has been to introduce this notion of different kinds of fibers, how they're produced, and how they ultimately get into your hands as a knitter. So we have gone to some farms, including Leslie's, because of her extremely charming sheep. <laughs> I do pick sheep for their, for their attributes that will make all knitters fall madly in love with them and then have to use their stuff, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, 
So there are my knitters uh, really uh, interacting with Leslie's sheep, which is a very unique experience for people who live in cities and don't have that opportunity. Um, and then, yeah, we went to Mark Hale's mill, we went to Cynthia's sheep and dyed our yarns. So it's an attempt to just bring everybody into the fold, so to speak. On my needles is Robin's um, Meridian Jacobs wool, which is another farm we visited. And um, so she's still here in my hands at the moment. And I encourage you to explore her yarn. It's very, very, very nice. All right, more about our project later. Mm -hmm. Who's next? Thank you, Gail. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. Who's speaking? Good. Hi, I'm Sarah Danu of Danu Organic, um, a clothing collection that I launched June 6th this summer. Um, before I launched that, um, well, I'd had samples made before I met Sally um, of clothes. I'd been considering launching a clothing line for probably like five years, and just because I'm, I'm an entrepreneur for the sake of entrepreneurship, and so this was like, something I'd had in the back of my mind for a long time, but it never felt right until I met Sally and um, learned about her work. And um, so I, I remade all of my garments in her fabric um, right away, and it just kind of took off from there. Um, that's just a photo. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, Getting a little lost here. You can read it up there, our, our mission statement. And um, since I launched, I launched just with women's, uh, a women's gathering in Oregon where um, it was kind of a perfect fit and um, actually completely sold out of clothes in the first launch of it. And so since then, I've been able to add men's clothes and children's clothes and babies' clothes and expand my size range a little bit. So that's been um, really fabulous. Um, um, yeah, so let's see. And as Danu grows, I'm really hoping that I can be that bridge for other people while still continuing to work with Sally's fibers, but also moving in and looking at linen and hips that are grown here in the area and kind of being that bridge. Um, my family background is in farming. I've met in generations and generations back. Um, we're all farmers. I grew up on a farm, and my um, career prior to this was in farm-to-table food and scaling a business very similar to Good Eggs on the East Coast. And um, so that connection was just missing for me. Like where I was buying organic cotton, organic hemp, but I, I could not get to the source and then feel good about sharing and spreading what I'm working on. And um, Sally's fabric is just that. So thank you. So we're talking about relationships here. And um, how long ago was this that we had this, where we met? A year and a half. A year and a half. So there are a few people here who were involved in this meeting. There was um, um, Sierra and Elaine of Elaine Hamlin of Cosa Arts, and our fiber shed. Um, why am I forgetting names? This is awful. Uh, it's the mic. It makes me nervous. Please forgive me. Um, they had a day where I got to explain my cotton at Elaine's shop called Cosa Arts, and invited designers of, and Sarah was one of them. And it was a small gathering. What were there, six people there? And so I spoke for about two hours, and I took orders for fabrics, and um, because I had just finally produced enough cotton to take orders for fabric. And I got these orders, and the two came struck the southeastern United States where my yarn was to be spun. The first one just wrecked part of the building the spinning that was in, and the second one 
injure the owner of the spinning mill. And so instead of being able to supply the fabric in three months, like I was supposed to, what was it, Ele uh, 11 months oh later, finally, after numerous back and forths, there was finally the, hey, it is actually here. And Sarah just drove up in her van. What did you do? You had to get, you had to, <laughs> well, I was on a boat in Mexico at that point, actually. I'd sailed there, and um, I, Sally texted me, and um, within about, immediately, we had someone sailing with us who, English was their second language, and they didn't quite understand, but like, immediately I was gone. I, I got on a plane in an hour, and um, flew here, got in a van, camped at the campground near Sally's farm to pick up this fabric, because I had all of like, um, maybe two weeks to um, make it the deadline for my launch event. So, um, <laughs> it's kind of crazy. <laughs> so, I'm, I, I'll go through these slides a little bit more quickly, but okay, so the point is, is that I've been doing this a long time. I started out doing breeding and producing and designing fabrics with my cotton since the 1980s, and I, um, <laughs> I improved the fiber quality without losing the plant's innate strengths. At least, this was my goal. Um, I'm sure I've lost something wonderful in all this, but I've been trying to breed the plants in a way that, captured, that allowed them to still be as close to their original self as possible, but with fiber that was spinnable and launderable um, under our regular circumstances of the modern life. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a brief, whoops, okay, I'm done. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, another time. There you go. The longer you work on something, the shorter your time gets. This is right. Okay. So there we go. But I also have sheep, too. Here we go. <laughs> so who's next? Okay. I think we're going, it's okay. Are we, we're ready for questions, right? Okay, just checking, sorry. Um, the first question, now we're gonna transfer into questions um, for the panel, and the first one is for Molly. Um, can you describe how you navigated into natural dyes? What investigative efforts did you make, and who did you meet in the process? And then I think you, Judy had referenced, um, can, you, can you refer how like Judy's skill set and that relationship complemented your own, and, and how you felt about the delivery of those things? the class? Um, yeah, the the journey to natural dyes was really uh, by chance. Um, Aaron, who's here, uh, told me that if I wanted to plant a thousand indigo plants, I could. And I thought, why not? Um, and so I went to, I was planning to pick up the indigo plants and I was going to drive a small car because it was kind of far away. And I thought that would be good for gas. And Aaron was like, you should bring a big car. <laughs> So I brought a truck and I picked up the indigo plants, which weren't that big, but, um, and um, I planted them not really having planted anything at that scale before. Um, and luckily enough, Fibershed has a ton of resources on their website, which I just started kind of slowly working through. Um, they have a great, they had a great um, tutorial on indigo planting and harvesting, which I referenced multiple times. Um, and then I journeyed onto their uh, producer network, um, which is a separate little um, world on their website. And I started kind of going through the artists um, who work with natural dyes, knowing that I would want to do something with the indigo once it um, was mature. And um, Judy was the closest. <laughs> um, but more than that, she also just, um, I was able to find her Instagram and her stuff was really beautiful. So um, I DM'd her on Instagram and I introduced myself and uh, we decided to meet. We met, we kind of, you know, introduced one another, each other, ourselves. And then um, we decided that we liked each other and that it would be, <laughs> it would be okay to work with one another. Um, we, you know, not having been strangers, we kind of wanted to establish a little bit of trust and we did. And then um, we planned a workshop and we knew that we wanted to make some money to you know, cover our expenses. And um, so we kind of designed the workshop together. Um, and I put all of the indigo extraction 
duties to Judy, knowing that I probably wouldn't have the capacity to figure it out and honestly not really, just not having that in my wheelhouse. Um, and luckily, I was right. Um, Judy asked me to come up one day after we harvested this indigo um, to help her, but she was a little overwhelmed with the amount that <laughs> had been delivered to her doorstep. Um, and um, That was my truck bed. <laughs> And when I got there, I was equally as overwhelmed by what she was doing, which um, included like baking equipment and um, trash cans full of liquid and tarps. Um, Fermenting liquid. And like burners and things to warm water, ice troughs. Um, and I was just stunned at the complexity of the work and um, really at that point knew that this would have never um, really worked out if it hadn't been for her really sophisticated skill set, um, which was just so crucial in order to get the pigment to its final, final. Um, yeah, there's there's a picture <laughs> of a trash can full of indigo, um, and there's some dye, and. Um, <laughs> Yeah. yeah, well, I think the next, Judy, I don't know if you got, if this is appropriate, but if you wanted to describe, yeah. now the next question is actually for Judy about yeah. what you did at the class with the students, and um, if you could say also how working with Molly maybe provided you an opportunity to focus on your core skill set while teaching, and what was important to you about this partnership? Sure. I'm going to kneel right here, because it's, it's easier for me to see. but. Um, can we go back to yeah, yeah. Go one to of the, the yeah, yeah. Right. total control there? I don't know. I'm not, I'm not dealing with that. There very you well. go. Go all the way back to the. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so that's um, we harvested about July, right? Or was that yeah. earlier? It was June. June. Okay. So um, we did get two harvests out of the Persicaria. Um, thousand plants, as she said, um, came from the True Blue project, if I'm right, remembering correctly. So this is the first harvest, and I drove it. I live about 45 minutes away from Molly, so I took it home, and then started figuring out what to do with it. There are different ways to extract the color from indigo. I tried out a couple, and then the one that was my favorite for the quantity that, that I had was to ferment it. And we can go, yeah, okay. We'll come back to that other one. Let's go to the one in the trash. There we go. So that's indigo fermenting. At about three days, it starts to look like that. It's got this kind of um, antifreeze, turquoise color. And take all of the leaves out. And then you go through a process of moving it back and forth. You're introducing oxygen into it, and adding lime. And then this precipitation starts to happen. That's how you get the extract. So the color, it starts to fall to the bottom. And then you've got to strain it out and dry it. We'll rinse it, dry it, and then um, you know, beat it up. Use a mortar and pestle or some kind of a spice grinder to get it powdery fine. So um, it's wonderful. I want to look back at that slide. It just, um, if you decide to ferment it, uh, it's smelly, and every fly within 100 miles will come and descend upon your, your working space. So just keep that in mind. OK. Uh, back, let's go to the field one. If can, there we go. So um, the workshop was happening. And what was so awesome about having the workshop on location was that from about 50 feet uh, away from where we were going to do the process of dip dyeing shibori, and we had black walnut happening too. We could walk into the garden and take a look at all the plants growing and talk about the process. So that was just so amazing for me to be able to do that and such a great gift. So thanks Molly and Emily for that. Okay, continuing, yep. Um, so what you see here, um, I had a couple of apps going so there was uh, we had two ferrous vats, we had cotton that we were dyeing, and a fructose vat. And what I did, because I was traveling, um, I did the vats on location, but I had the mother batches in the containers that you see there that are empty. Then um, once I was on location, put those mother batches into the 25 gallon trash can and then added water. 
Right. And this is a, an image of extraction. I don't know if you can quite see it, but there is a difference in color. So if you notice, yeah. see the sludge at the bottom? That's your indigo dropping down to the bottom of the container, and it's ready to rinse. Okay, there it is, drying. And some more pictures. Um, in the, when you're agitating it with the lime, it's getting this beautiful, uh, gorgeous blue color on top. And you can skim that off and use it, and in addition to the blue that settles in the bottom. And there's a picture of a drawing. Okay. Agitating it. Oh, action shot. You can, you can skip that. <laughs> and there we are, there's the dried product. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you so much, Molly and Judy. Um, the next question is for Leslie. It's got two parts. Um, can you share with us what your collaboration with Gail, um, how it allowed you to shift your attention and focus to with your own student participants, and how that would have been different without a collaborative partner like Gail? Well, thanks to Gail, um, the knitters retreat that we had with uh, our collaboration was, um, in my mind, the best thing that we have done at our farm ever, because you saw the uh, little <laughs> syllabus. We were able to have four hours to um, cover many, many topics which go on at the farm every day, and Gail brought her uh, extreme experience and expertise in yarns and knitting, as well as her relationship with knitters and her amazing teaching ability, um, to my operation, I'm a jack of all trades. I do everything, you know, I call myself a knitting shepherd. Um, and it was a way to um, get into more topics than we've ever gotten into before and, um, and to make many connections. Um, Gail also um, brought an amazing uh, uh, pattern for a hat that she designed just to go with our special yarns. Um, and she'll talk about that later and we're going to pass it around as long as there's a monitor following it. Um, so it's two-sided, you guys. Between the two of us, the collaboration made for a really great day, and we also had um, the benefit of two other collaborators, um, two other tender shepherds, which is the group that we, some of us at Fibershed started last year, of uh, shepherds who um, let their sheep live their natural lives in a kind of a happy way, and, and everyone benefits good karma. Um, so uh, Amy Skizas and Brooke Sambal gave their perspective, um, added a lot of perspective to the shepherding part as well as the permaculture part, um, which is a major thing that goes on. And Gail, Gail made it all flow. And Leslie, can you, can you um, touch on that for, in, briefly? Mm -hmm. um, can you, what's the importance, societally speaking, of providing that level of education? to the public, do you think, on the things you were talking about, tender shepherds, any of that? I think it's crucial. Um, I've done a lot of um, smaller things at the farm. Uh, people from the farmer's market asked to come out, and I've, I've tailored different um, little, little classes focusing on something or other. But um, there's nothing that is substituted for um, hands-on experience on a farm. If you are interested in where you're clothes come from and what is involved, good and bad, um, there's just no substitute for going to a farm, seeing um, how the land can be managed in a way that actually draws down carbon from the environment, and to see that um, you can have beautiful wool and happy long-lived animals as well, um, and to see where to, to pet the sheep, brush the sheep, feel the sheep, 
see the colors and then see the yarns that um, are made from them. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful thing. People love it. Thank you, Leslie. The other part of this partnership. Gail, can you share, please, a brief overview of who you've engaged from the regional fiber and milling community here, and also how you've engaged them? And I don't want to skew your answer too much, but I personally feel that Gail is very mindful of farmer time mm -hmm. and the value to return to them. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy that you would say that because it's a very big focus for me. Uh, the work of producing yarn, whether it's the lives of the sheep, which after all they're the source producer, right? The shepherding of them, the shearing of them, the dyeing, the production, the milling, all of that, it's an extremely fragile supply chain. And understanding that and valuing it and being willing to pay for it is crucial to continue to support it. And the only way I feel like people will own that and make those kinds of choices is if they have some kind of authentic connection and understanding of what that means. So to walk in and say, I want knitters to understand what you do, is one thing, or I'll bring someone to the mill, but that's a whole day's work for that person. And that's costly, incredibly costly, when you're a, a single shepherd or a person who runs a mill by herself or any of those things. So for me, putting some kind of value on the hosting of that and the preparation of that and then bringing people to it with an understanding that you know, we're gonna buy this yarn. And I don't leave it to chance. If you come with me to a farm, you are buying that yarn. It's part of what happens when you say you're coming. Because part of this as well is working with it. So you will have a unique opportunity to make that hat. Or a pair of mittens that we designed at the at the mill or whatever it is, we will pay the farmer for hosting us and we won't take up their time because I'm bringing lunch, I'm organizing transportation, I'm making sure that everybody's there. I, I didn't, I really do mean it that it's a catalytic role. I don't really have a dog in the fight, basically, but what I really want is for everybody to have the experience of understanding what our fiber shed is, who's in it, and why it should be very important to you. That's and all. Gail, just sorry, just one, one quick thing. I know we're almost out of time on this one, but can you briefly talk about, um, you talked okay. on some of those pieces, but specifically the pattern um, that you did for your specific visit to Leslie's farm. Can you speak to that a little bit, to the hat that's being passed around? Sure. So each, each visit to wherever we go, whatever I do, includes a project. And it's the, for me, having it in my hands is, is the, whole, the whole enchilada, really. The reason that I went to Leslie's is because when I felt the yarn, it, it was just fabulous in my hands. And so then it was a matter of coming up with what does this yarn want to be? Because, right, yarn has its own agenda. And actually it started that, I knew it wanted to be a hat and I knew it wanted to be uh, many colored because by keeping sheep all their lives, you have this beautiful array of color that comes out of a flock. Their color changes as they age. So this is a fabulous thing and the wissants come in many colors. So hence the multicolors of the hat and yeah, I mean, the hat speaks for itself. It sure does. <laughs> <laughs> we have kits for We have kits available. At my Heartfelt Fiber Farm stand. Yes, yes, in yes. In the church space and today. And there are kits at Robin's from the visit to her farm, and kits, maybe kits at Markale's from the visit to her Great. farm. Great, thank so. you so much. Go shop. People. Thank you. Go shop. <laughs> thank you, yeah. <laughs> if you're going to shop anywhere, I mean. <laughs> There's really no better stuff you could be buying.
Um, Sarah, this one's for you. You've talked a little bit about the first moment, how you, or, and Sally as well, when you first met, um, and how her fabric inspired you and kind of resonated with your background in food systems. But what else would you like people in the audience to understand about your partnership? And could you share how you see your relationship with Sally in the context of the current system of textile production and what's different about it? Thank yes. Um, so I met Sally at that event at Cosa Arts in Oakland. Um, it was Slow Fashion Week, and I was um, just attending. I think we're done with slides. Um, just attending Slow Fashion Week events. Um, I was new to the Bay Area, and I think my main goal that day was to make friends. <laughs> um, but I, I didn't really know what was going to happen at that event where I met Sally, which I don't even think you know. But um, I showed up and heard Sally speak and um, was just amazed. It's not about my work with Donu Organic. It's not even about Sally's work. It's about this plant that has the potential to provide this color that I'm wearing, that Sally's wearing, that requires no dye at a scale that actually makes it really useful in the world. And that's something that Sally was really clear about from the beginning. Um, and so I was just there. Sally had the actual plant, lots of samples, listening to Sally's 37 years of work that she'd put into cultivating this plant and getting it ready for production, which I'm still just understanding little pieces of. Um, and at the end of the event, Sally was taking orders, and I went to make friends. But at the end of the event, I think I committed to buying $10,000 of Sally's fabric, <laughs> um, which was interesting to talk to my husband about when I got home. Um, and um, so then I don't think I'd seen Sally again um, until the fabric arrived, uh, which took quite a lot longer than we expected. Um, so I, I, it was all quite a thing. but. Um, yeah, the time is now. Um, people are ready for this. People don't buy things because uh, it's sustainable. People buy things because it's beautiful. And with clothes, we have a lot of potential to reach people um, with sustainable practices. The sustainability is more of a justification for the average consumer. Like, I love this. Oh, and it's sustainable. Hmm, that like, <laughs> makes sense. So um, that's a, a great potential that I see in partnering with Sally and other people that are doing work like Sally um, to have a really big impact, um, which is what we need. And um, Sally has done so much to get this to a place that we could have this partnership before I knew her. Um, years and years of work to make it scalable. So that's um, our goal and the potential that I think it has to elevate. Um, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, and Sally, uh, how are you currently building partnerships with designers? And specifically, can you share anything you're doing with the design community to engage them with the importance of continuing your very long, hard-won lineage of colored cotton braiding? <laughs> Well, the main thing I'm doing is um, using whatever resources I have to produce some yarns and fabrics for, for my designer collaborators here. Sarah, outside you'll see Harvest and Mill, you'll see Cosa Arts. Every, it's like this beautiful, beautiful, <laughs> Uh, I don't even have the words, right? It's just so incredible because every single designer has a different way and a different, a different idea of how to use it. And it, in addition to what I can afford to translate into fabrics for people to buy, I continue to provide, uh, produce um, and ship co organic cotton to Japan. This shirt that I'm wearing was sewn by Kosa Arts out of fabric that I, this is my cotton and organic white cotton, dyed, the dye is indigo in Japan and um, Kosa sewed it up, I brought the fabric back. Um, the same, the pants are just my cotton and organic white. But also the latest thing is I've revived um, working with a sheet manufacturer in North Carolina we finally, after years of work, got um, revived but made better. The old field crest cannon sheets that I spent a few years designing that yarn for, and that yarn was very successful. It was a half a million pounds of yarn was spun out of that design, which 
uh, made a big difference. So, um, but when the textile industry collapsed and all the mills closed that I was selling to, it didn't matter that the product was selling, no one could get the yarn made and no one could, so they had to drop the whole project. And a lot of people, including me, still sleep on these sheets. So I started working with this, another, uh, this woman in her company to put out the sheets and they just came out and if you is it American Blossoms? American Blossom, yeah. yeah. And the, for the first time, since we're talking about collaborations, there um, there's a code. If you buy the sheets, you put in Sally Fox 15, no spaces, and they give you a 15% discount. But they're giving me 15% for my breeding program, oh, which is great. really something. And I put out a newsletter, and oh, <laughs> it's interesting that, that already the amount of money from the sales on this code is exceeding what they what was paid for the cotton itself. Like. Oh. <laughs> oh going to make a difference. So Wonderful. in a nutshell, every single designer here, Sarah, everybody here that uses my cotton is making it possible for this to make a difference. Because that's the real goal, is that it gets back into commerce and it makes an environmental difference. That's the only reason I've been doing this all this time. And that's why I treasure my relationships with my designers. And Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. On that note, it is 12.30. It's time for lunch break. Thank you to all of you for your work on your own and also together.